Uh, I'm not going to say it's like difficult, but uh, it's a, a more of a, um, inclusive test, uh, unit test and class test. We are now mm -hmm. in unit one, which is poetry. So we'll give it a couple of classes, the lessons too, related to poetry. And then uh, definitely I will let you know when is the uh, class test. They also yes. we're going to have a quiz, a small quiz. Uh, on uh, uh, poem analysis, uh, which is not going to be difficult. Again, 10 marks. It's, it's simple, easy. But we're going to take it one step at a time. Okay. Any yes. questions so far? Uh, no. Uh, Safa, do you have any, any questions? No. All right, perfect. Okay, so first of all, let me... Uh, just a second. Start with something nice, something easy. Um. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to start by a video, a very uh, nice video uh, about a teacher who is already explaining uh, ideas how to understand the poetry. She herself was not so fond of poetry, but again, we learned from uh, everybody else here, share sound, okay. I used to hate poetry. Like I was trained as a journalist and so I've always been about nonfiction, just the facts. And when I was a new English teacher, I had no idea how to approach a poem and I felt like I was missing a lot of what was happening. Like the smarter people around me would like nod thoughtfully and furrow their brows and have like, you know, interesting things to say about the words on the page where and I was just like, I don't get it. So I actually spent some time figuring out how to figure out poetry. And now I, I don't say it's my favorite. I still don't love it. I don't read poetry for fun, you know, on a Friday night, um, but I, I can appreciate what's happening on the page now. And so I wanna share with you a system that I came up with that helps my kids break down poems so that we really understand and can dig into them and have a rich experience, even if it's not necessarily your favorite thing in the world. And if you love poetry, hey, that's awesome. Love what you love. This is actually a handy tool to help you as well. So this week I want to talk about how to read a poem. This week we are not going to dig into a specific poem. I'm just going to lay the groundwork about a few steps, nine steps actually, that you can use when your English teacher gives you a poem or you see it on a standardized test. You know, if there's some environment where you have to dig into some lines, this is going to be a helpful path. All right, first of all, show no fear. It's really, it's going to be okay. Okay. Do not be afraid of the poem. You are not going to understand everything the first time you read it. And that's okay. So it's actually part of the fun of unpacking the package of a poem and starting to understand and see and notice small things along the way. Some of them are very dense and some of them i still don't get everything that's in there and that's okay that's part of the fun of the process so surrender that idea and don't be afraid all right we're going to start with the title of a poem so and then you're just going to stop you're just going to sit and consider what this might be about just thinking about that title where do you think you're going to be going decide that before you move into the actual lines then you're gonna read that poem all the way through. I don't want you to stop. You're just gonna keep on trucking because in this step three, you're just trying to get the gist. Do you have a general understanding about what happens in the poem? We'll dig into details on later steps and like, you know, iron out any wrinkles. But for now, just do you kind of understand what's going on in this poem? Number four, you're then gonna read it again, but this time you're gonna annotate as you do. And way back at the beginning of the year, I wanna say it was like the second Freestyle Friday that we had, we talked about annotation. I gave you some tools for that. Use those tools. Basically, if you have a copy that you can write on, that's fabulous. If not, do it on sticky notes or just like write comments on a, you know, speak, a piece of uh, binder paper. It doesn't matter. But you're basically going to write down and notice anything that you really like that jumps out at you as being interesting. Anything that reminds you of something else because it might be an, an allusion to a, another work that you're familiar with. Circle anything that you think is confusing. Chances are there's probably pretty something pretty interesting happening in that confusing check section once you break it down. 
And then anything that you think, hmm, this seems like it's important, but I don't know why, mark that. Now, you're going to go back and you're going to look up any words that you don't know. Use your dictionary, grab your phones. Poets use very limited words, right? A poem is very short, generally. And so they're, they're very mindful of every word they pack into that small space, like their words matter a lot. So if there's a word you don't know, you might be missing a whole bunch of meaning from that. So make sure that you have your definitions down and you know what the words actually mean. Then I want you to identify who is the narrator of the poem. It's not necessarily the poet. In fact, it's probably not the poet himself or herself. Instead, it's a person whose guys they've taken on, who's you know, like those that's the lens that we're seeing this situation through. So as best you can, figure out anything you can about the narrator. Are they sarcastic? Are they maternal? What is the point that they want us to take away from it? Who is talking to us? Then the seventh step, we're almost there. Remember, there are only nine, is noticing shifts or contradictions or changes. If the narrator is trucking along and then all of a sudden a hinge word like a but or however comes up in the poem, generally it's like two thirds into the poem, but nevertheless, you know, and then whatever comes after that hinge is probably the point of the poem. So pay attention if you notice any shifts or changes because that's where the meaning is probably right after that. Look at the structure. How did this poet put the words on the page, right? What's the rhyme scheme? Does the, the physical structure meter add to the meaning of the poem? More modern poets, they actually like physically take up a lot of white space on the page and some of them even make images with how the words are placed, like that's important. It's not by accident. So what meaning can we give to that? And then finally, my friend, you're almost there. Just read it one more time out loud, if possible, if people won't think you're crazy, like don't do this during the SAT. <laughs> but if you're in a situation where you can actually hear the words after you've done that deep study and dug into it, read it one more time and see if that doesn't help solidify everything and make it concrete. Congratulations, you guys. You now have a nine steps to success about how to read a poem. Next week, I think we might dig into a poem or two, but don't worry, I'll go easy on you. It's always fun, more than, more than frustrating around here on the YouTube channel, or at least I try to make it that way. I hope you guys had a great week, are set for a great weekend. I'll be back on Monday with grammar like we do. Wednesday is always vocab. And then next Friday, a little, let's put those steps into practice with a little poetry reading. All right, I'll see you guys then. Have a great one. Be great. Bye, y'all. Okay, so I really hope that you get the, the essence of what she said and how you need to, uh, you know, uh, to start liking poetry. I know that not everybody likes poetry, but let's let's give it a try here. So let's see in this poem, who is the speaker? What is the speaker want to tell you here in this one? <clears throat> Let me share. All right. So let's let's look first of all to the uh, the title of the poem as as per her advice. The teacher's advice is there is a, a process, first of all, you do, do not have to fear of the poem. You don't have to, to feel like, you know, I am not going to understand, especially for those of you who never studied poetry before. So first of all, you need to think of the title. Look at the title. And then you start reading stanza by stanza and let's analyze it all together. Now, let's look here. Who'd like to start reading? Uh, Yusuf, uh, Yusuf, please read. Uh, sure. Um, stolen Rivers. Mm -hmm. For uh, Chin, I, I don't know how to say that name. Shuanisu Chiwon... Mariri. Um, Mariri. Okay. Of course. Uh, uh, do you have any idea the name Shuanisu Mariri could be what? Uh, no, from which country? I'm from sure. which place? Okay, Africa? you will see. Yes, yes, you, you will see that he's from Africa. Okay, so you are going to read the first stanza and uh, Safa will going to read the next one. Let's go. Yeah, okay. Uh, we Africans came to Berlin to sing and recite poetry. 
We had an agenda, remembering our anthems of loss, galloping, consuming, the pillage, the cries, the, like forest fires, like haunted children. How can we, how can we even begin to redress? Uh, enraged, we wanted revenge. And then Chiwanisu, you stepped on the stage and you opened your mouth. And every stolen river of platinum and gold poured out of your mouth in song. Um, your voice etched us out of the night and doubted the light in each of us. You restored all the treasure houses from Benin to Zimbabwe. Uh, uh, Mapango. Mapango to Cairo. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa moved its golden bones, shook off its heavy chains and danced again. Okay. Of course, the last stanza, sorry, Safa, maybe uh, he, he continued and I didn't want to stop him because I felt he's like, you know, uh, there is a flow. Uh, then oh, uh, finish sorry. the last stanza, please. It's okay. Uh, that night, I thought if only love could purchase bread, Africans would not be hungry. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Now, uh, Safa and you also, Yusuf, first of all, how did you feel? Now, I want you to appreciate poetry. So without understanding anything, how did you feel? How? What was the effect of the words on you? Safa, tell me, please. Um, I felt that they were telling a story or like a traumatizing story. All right, perfect. So there is something, there is some kind of, you know, um, uh, driving you emotionally towards said something. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yusuf. Um, I felt like, uh, yeah, like the, the poem is uh, motivating or maybe inspiring. Yes, um, it is inspiring, absolutely, but it is not motivating unless you looked at the word revenge and you felt it's a kind of provoking to the people to revenge. But yes. to be honest, uh, not exactly, because uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, a poet who tries to tell a sad story. What is the sad story here? I think um, the sad story is he's talking about... Uh... How Africa, they were uh, other countries. They stole like um, they still they stole gold and uh, like they stole resources mm -hmm. from Africa. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there is a leader, and he is stepping up um, mm -hmm. in Africa to, yes, to try to reclaim. reclaim yes, the, absolutely. So the yes. the here in this poem is trying to express his feelings and sad feelings about what happened to Africa. Of course, I don't know if you studied that in history or not. You know that the, uh, the world was somehow occupied by superpowers. Africa was one of them. Uh, Africa was invaded and occupied by the British and the uh, the British, the, the French, and the Italians. The Italians got some uh, countries, uh, among them Libya, and of course the British occupied uh, Egypt and occupied many of the uh, Middle East countries, and the French occupied uh, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, part of Palestine was occupied by the British, and so on. So, of course, it looks like that the poet is lamenting. And I want you to get used to this word, lamenting, meaning like, you know, express sadness by certain words. Uh, the lamenting the fact that Africa was stolen. And he here is uh, asking everybody to join him in his sadness and tell, uh, listen to the uh, story, okay? Now, there is here a mention of the highlighted word Shwenizu. Shwenizu. This is, uh, do you have any idea who is Shwenizu? Uh, I'm, okay, I so I just so. want you to, give, to get the full understanding. I'm going to give you 10 minutes for you to um, Google who is Shwenizu and what did he do in Africa. 
go online and try to find out. Uh, it's just saying that um, Shwanusu was uh, a singer and songwriter. Yes, he is a songwriter. Are you guys familiar with uh, Bob Marley from Jamaica? Uh, yes. Excellent. So uh, it's uh, Bob Marley is like, you know, I, I, uh, an icon. He's an icon for the suffering, icon for the struggle, uh, icon for uh, uh, we're not going to surrender all of this kind of, of, of you know, uh, human feelings. So Shwanis was also a similar figure in Africa. And he used to write, um, I'm not going to say provocative, but it's patriot, patriotic yes. songs to, uh, to, to take care, to protect the country and to lament the fact that Africans shouldn't be surrendering to the uh, occupation and so on. So yes. uh, the, the, poet, the poet is also trying to uh, highlight this uh, moments, appreciate this moments, and you could feel it in, in his uh, poems. Now, this is how you will be doing in any poem. You will try to figure out what is the title about, what is it about, the theme of the poem, uh, what is the writer uh, message, what he wants to, to instill in his readers and listeners, and then this is the first step. The second step is to try to understand stanza by stanza. Sometimes if you stop at one line, you won't understand anything. Sometimes you need the whole stanza in order to understand the, say, the idea that the poet is focusing on. Now let's read one more time. This time, Safa, you're going to read up till begin to redress. This is the first stanza. Can you please start? We Africans came to Berlin to sing and recite poetry. We had an agenda, remembering our anthems of loss, galloping, consuming, the pillage, the cries, like forest fires, like haunted children. How can we, how can we even begin to redress? Excellent, excellent. So what kind of introduction is the poet saying here? And I want you to imagine or to, to give me a, a good guess who is the audience? Anyone? Uh, the audience. Um, the, the audience would be the people who were affected, like who are Africans, because it says um, we. It says we Africans, huh? and uh, it says how how can we even begin to redress? So mm -hmm. I think the audience would be. Do you think the audience is, are uh, is the poet talking to ourselves, like uh, are we are talking to ourselves as Africans, or there is a, a, a second party, a third party here? Um, not sure. We Africans came to Berlin to sing, and recite poetry. We had an agenda, remembering our anthem of loss, galloping, consuming, the pillage, the cries, like forest fires, like haunted children. How can we, how can we even begin to redress? Who is the poet talking to? Maybe the Germans and themselves. Excellent. So he's talking to the audience, you know, that uh, like in uh, Hyde Park in London, people like also in Ottawa in front of the Parliament House, people, it's it's an open air, it's an open uh, park or any anybody can say anything and people go there to start talking and passersby would listen, stop and listen, okay? So like in Hyde Park, the poets and even people who want to preach for Christianity or Islam, anybody can go and uh, talk and people listen or, or argue, discuss and leave. OK, so the poet here did the same to the audience, a crowd standing in Berlin in one of the 
parks and he uh, justifies why is he uh, talking to them and starts of course talking about uh, we Africans why did we come to Berlin we come to explain to you to tell our story in the form of a song and form of a poetry and the, the, the passion that we have is just like the passion of the children and the forest fires, like we have fire inside us because what is happening to us, okay? So this is the first stanza. Let's move to the second one, up to uh, Cairo. Can you please read again, uh, Yusuf, and try to explain? Okay. Uh, enraged, we wanted revenge, and then... Chuanisu, you stepped on the stage and you opened your mouth and every stolen river of platinum and gold poured out of your mouth in song. Your voice etched us out of the night and doubled the light in each of us. You restored all the treasure houses from Benin to Zimbabwe. Uh, Mapa, I don't have to say that. Map, map, Mapano. Mapano, uh, Mapano to Cairo. All right. Uh, what can you tell me about this stanza? Um, stanza, I feel like... The stanza is um, equivalent to a uh, paragraph yeah. in regular English. Yeah. Mm. Stanza is talking about how the, the singer, Jonisu, when she stepped on the stage, you know, to come to perform, to sing, her mm -hmm. singing is uh, like uh, so powerful Mm -hmm. that it is um, releasing like uh, every stolen river of platinum and gold through her song. Like mm -hmm. her, her music, her, her singing has the ability is to restore what, uh, what has been stolen away, what has been taken away from Africa. Excellent, excellent. So here is a paradigm shift. The, the poet here is giving us a paradigm shift. The first two li uh, first line, he says, we are full of anger, we are furious, and we wanted revenge. Look, and then, meaning here, we changed our mind. We're not going to go for violence. We're not going to go for killing other people. We're not going to go for shooting guns. We are going to, like, uh, step on the stage and come on top of the stage and, and shoot with our mouth. Sometimes we say the word is mightier than the sword. Have you ever heard of this uh, proverb, anyone? Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So exactly here she wanted to say, or the poet wants to say that the singer with her words, the poet with her uh, singing and, and, and words, the powerful words, uh, she is revenging without shedding a drop of blood. So this is how powerful she is and how powerful the geographical extensions from Zimbabwe up to Cairo. It's like all Africa, all in the central and middle of Africa. All right. So let's move to the last one. Uh, um, Safa? Yeah. Africa moved its gold bo golden bones, shook off its heavy chains, and danced again. That night, I thought if only love could purchase breed, Africans would not be hungry. Yes, excellent, excellent. So again, what is uh, what is the poet wants to t to tell us here? Hmm? That they released like uh, when they were um, like captivated, they got released and they started dancing again, and uh, they have everything back. Yes, the, so uh, it says that without shedding uh, blood, without uh, uh, killing any person with the words and with the uh, resistance and all of that, Africa moved its golden bones, shook off its heavy chains and danced again. Do you think Africa can dance? Is Africa a little girl? Yeah. What can you tell me about these yellow highlighted lines? <clears throat> uh, it's a metaphor. 
Excellent. What kind of metaphor here? Of course, uh, this is what we call a poetical device, but uh, this is, uh, here is a kind of uh, a more specific metaphor. It's not uh, a general metaphor. Uh, there is a more specific uh, poetical device here. Look at Africa. Is Africa um, a human being or a thing? A thing. Absolutely. So when I give anything uh, like uh, an animal or uh, um, an element of nature or a place and I give it one of the characteristics of human beings, it is called the personification. So the poet here uh, personalizes Africa as if she is a girl who is dancing and sh shaking off her heavy chains and she is now dancing. So here is a personification, okay? Now, if you look up here, what else can you see here in, in, uh, in this stanza? What poetical device, sound and image? Can, can anybody tell me? Uh, for which stanza? Uh, the first one here. Uh, let's see if it came to Berlin to see. Uh, yeah, there is sing and consuming. This, yes. this is rhyming. Very good. So we have sing and consuming. Yes, and, and notice it, it is not because the, the ending are the same. It's uh, the way we pronounce. That's why my advice to you, dear students, is to read the poem aloud or at least uh, murmuring the, the sound for yourself to listen with your eyes. So he says, uh, we Africans came to Berlin to sing and recite poetry. We had an agenda remembering our anthem of loss, galloping, consuming. So there is here a stress. When you hear it, you will listen to the stress. Uh, so you could tell that the, uh, the, the stress, the syllable at the end here, give you the same sound effect. So yes, there is rhyming here. What else can you see here? Uh, there is also like repetition. Um, you see the, the pillage, the cries, like forest fires, like haunted children. How can we, how can we? Like yes, so the purple thing here, how can we, how can we? Of course, here is a repetition. And we always know that the repetition is there to create a musical effect and at the same time to emphasize certain uh, ideas and also to create kind of uh, um, driving uh, readers to meditate and think over. That's a very uh, good one. There's okay. also mm -hmm. a metaphor says like like forest fires, um, like haunted children. Excellent. But this one, we don't call it metaphor. We call it simile. simile. Why simile? Because we have the word like. Yes. So when you see like or as or as if Definitely, it is simile. The metaphor, if I say, I am a haunted uh, child, like, or, or if I say, the country is a haunted house, without any devices, without any words, then in that case, it is a metaphor. But here, definitely, it is a simile because we have the word. And yes. also here, begin, begin to redress. This is a rhetorical question. Just like when you can use it in uh, literature or in uh, novels, you still can use it in poetry. And the poet here is also using a rhetorical question. And look at here again, your voice etched us out of the night and doubled the light in each of us. What is night and light? What is night and light? Right. Absolutely. There is a kind of a musical effect again here. And of course, you can see the, uh, the choices of the, uh, the poet. And also, if you, when you are uh, analyzing a poem, you need to uh, take care of the theme. As you can see here, the, the theme, which is the main idea of the, um, of the piece, uh, sometimes you have different uh, themes, like a couple of themes and not only one. 
Uh, for me, I can I can definitely say that uh, many themes are introduced here, which is lamenting the occupation and this and that, and also uh, the the poet wants to give you an idea that the word is mightier than a sword. Uh, there is a tone. Also, you need to talk about the tone when I ask you to analyze a poem. You need to uh, tell me something about the tone. Uh, here, the tone is mixed a celebration and a cry for the current trouble of uh, South Africa, celebration of the liberation, and at the same time of the uh, mischief that Africa has been through. You can also, if there is any symbol, you can mention the symbol, the similes, the metaphors, the imagery. You can also talk about the form, the stanzas, and, and the, you know, if you can... Uh, what we call the physical description of the poem. So this is now I give you an example of how to analyze a poem. Uh, let's put it into uh, a kind of uh, uh, tips for us to remember. Uh, I had another thing. I prepared something for you to get the tips on uh, how to understand a poem. Uh, of the skip ads, okay. is going to take you through just some basic steps on how to analyze poetry. Um, we're going to start off with looking at how we can annotate the poem. So I'm going to use an example poem and I'm going to show you the way in which you can take a poem and write ideas around it. So annotate ideas around it, just like how we did with our short stories. The second thing that I'm going to take you through in this presentation is how to look beyond the literal. One of the most important things of poetry and music is looking at the deeper meanings of words and phrases, um, not just taking them for what they are, but looking deeper and thinking, you know, what could they be representative of? And then finally from there, uh, once we've broken down a, an example poem, we're going to draw meaning from the text. So by doing that, we're essentially asking ourselves, well, what was the poet's message? Because music and poetry, it's a form of art, but it's a form of art that conveys important ideas, um, expresses emotion. And so ultimately, at the end of any song or at the end of reading a poem, you kind of need to sit back and, and ask yourself, what was the point? What was the purpose? So that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, the poem that I've chosen as an example, it's a nice short one, is a poem by Robert Frost. Perhaps you've heard of it before. It's called The Road Not Taken. It's quite a famous poem. Um, before we even get into analysing it, it's always worth just to read through the text first. So that's what we're going to do right now. So let's read through. The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveller long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. Okay, so one of the questions that I tend to get a lot in this course in regards to analysing poetry is how do I analyse a poem that I've never seen before? Now, when it comes to poetry and music, generally speaking, they're all about the artist's feelings, their feelings towards a person, their feelings towards life, their feelings about an issue in society, whatever it might be. Poems and music 
are all about the emotion that that artist is feeling. So one of the first things that you need to do when it comes to analysing poetry is ask yourself, how does the poet feel? Find words and phrases or perhaps entire verses that convey some kind of emotion, whatever that might be. It might be excitement, it might be depression, it might be anxiety, it might be love. Um, but find out how the poet feels. And then from there, ask yourself, well, why does the poet feel that way? So if it is excitement, what has excited them? If it is love, then is it a relationship and, and what's happened? If it's depression, then what kind of uh, events have happened in that person's life or what has happened to make that person feel this way? And then once you've ascertained the feeling and what's caused it, you then need to think about, well, how do you know this? Okay, so what words and phrases that you can notice in the poem caused you to understand that or allowed you to see that point of view. Um, now this is where our poetic devices will come in. Okay, so what connotations did that word have or what did that phrase uh, symbolize? Okay, so three steps. What does the poet feel? What does the artist feel? Why is it that they're feeling that way? What's caused this feeling? And then how do you know that? Okay, what was it in the poem that gave that away? So let's have a look at the poem The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. One of the most important places to start with any poem, just like a short story, is with the title. Now, um, in this poem, there's a lot of reference to roads. Now, while this poem can be taken literally, maybe it is about a person walking through a wood and they come to a, a, a fork in the road where they have to go down one path or another, I think if we were to really think about it, you know, not just the literal meaning, uh, the road in this poem is more metaphorical. So it's a recurring symbol throughout the actual poem. It's, it's more about life's journey. Now, we often you know, symbolize our life as a road. You know, we take this path and then we take that path and this left turn. Well, in this poem, it's, it's all about those roads and those crossroads that we come to where we have to make a really important decision and we're not quite sure what to do. So that's the first thing that we can talk about. The second thing, um, it says that two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Now that's an important symbol. Whenever we're talking about colours, specifically in regards to nature, it can often tell us the season. So when we're talking about really green and luscious woods, then obviously we're probably talking about spring. Um, if we're talking about the, you know, the bright sun, then we're talking about summer. If we're talking about, you know, the, the rain clouds or the snow, then we're talking about winter. Now in this case, they've used the words yellow wood, and this is more symbolic of the season of autumn. So if we're going to relate this, you know, to someone's life, autumn is usually the season of life where we're aging, okay? Things are starting to, to, to come away, we're starting to, to get on, it's post-spring. So this is probably told from a persona's point of view, looking back on their life. Um, you know, a decision perhaps that they made that maybe wasn't the right decision or perhaps it was the best decision they ever made. Perhaps we should keep reading and then we'll find out. Ah, we get to the second line in this poem, and sorry, I could not travel both. Now here's where we get the tone. The tone is a word that we use to describe the emotion or the feeling that we take away. The fact that the persona has said, I'm sorry, I could not travel both, tells us that perhaps they're regretful. Um, you know, in life, you wish that you could sort of have both of those opportunities or make both of those decisions, live both of those moments, but often that's not the case and you tend to be regretful. What if I had done this? What if I didn't break up with him? What if I had have gone to that particular study group? Uh, you know, what if we hadn't moved house? Whatever it was, often decisions that we make, we can be regretful when we don't take the other. And be one traveller, long I stood. Now this part of the poem um, tells us a little bit about um, sometimes when we make decisions, the process that we go through is really difficult. Uh, the fact that the poet stood there long suggests to us that this decision wasn't easy. 
um, you know, that this is something that they really stewed over for a very long time. And then the poet says, and looked down one as far as I could, just like we can only see one path in the woods, okay, because if you're literally thinking about the woods, sometimes the path curves and, and the branches and, and the trees, you know, obscure the, the view. Sometimes we can't see the consequences of our decisions. Um, so we make decisions rashly and then sometimes we can regret them. And then this part of the poem here, the, de the decision is made, okay. The poet says, then I took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Uh, the po persona or the poet has said, this is the one I'm going to go down and, and they say that they go down because it looked grassy and wanted wear. So maybe this was more of the risky decision because not many people had done this before. Not many people had walked this path before because it wanted wear. Um, so in this sort of part of the poem, the persona is comparing the two and like life's road, you need to compare and make that choice and a choice is made very suddenly. Uh, maybe this is a metaphor for those sudden decisions that we sometimes make in life. Um, but either way, the poet made that choice. Then the tone of the poem kind of changes. It's almost as though at that last part it was exciting because the, the, jo the choice had been made. But then we go back to those two decisions. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. The paths, remember, are a symbol of choices. You've got choice A, one path, or choice B, the other path. Now in this part of the poem, the persona has said that they were equally laying in front of him or her. Um, so it's almost as though the persona wants to be able to take both roads because in their eyes they are equal, equally lay. Um, you know, a metaphor for being equally desirable. But having made that decision, they'll keep the first for another day. The persona doesn't dwell on his or her choices because you can always get second chances in life to make those decisions again. That's a really youthful point of view. Um, and even the use of the word, oh, you know, oh, I kept the first for another day. It sort of suggests this carelessness of youth. And often when we're young, we do make rash decisions. We do things on, on a whim and we don't think back about it. But remember, this is a poem that's probably being told by someone looking back because at the beginning it's told that, you know, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, suggesting the ageing of a person's life, like autumn, like the season of autumn. So perhaps this is the part where this rash decision in, in youthfulness was made. But here we're reminded, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. When we're young, we don't, we don't see those consequences of our decisions straight in front of us. But here, the persona is reminding us through the metaphor, way leads on to way, that unfortunately in life, you can only make one choice. You can't have them both. And chances are, you're never going to get those opportunities back again. And we know that that's what the persona means because the next line, they say, I shall be telling this with a sigh. So once again, we're reminded of this regretful, grieving tone. Um, the use of the word sigh suggests this, this sorrow, okay? It's a decision that can't be taken back. And then finally, at the end of the poem, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. The fact that the poet finishes the way they started with the, with the phrase, two roads diverged in a wood. Now that's repetition. Um, it takes us back to the very beginning of the poem. So this poem is very cyclical. It starts and ends in the same place, just like a circle. Uh, and that's sort of like a metaphor for the never ending cycle in life. Once that decision is made, this leads on to this and that leads on to that. And you're always going to be going around with these decisions in life. Um, you know, and the fact that they took the one less traveled by, that can be interpreted in a couple of ways. It could either be the one less traveled by, meaning it was a risk, um, they took a chance, or it could mean the one less traveled by, meaning perhaps not the safest decision, maybe not the best decision. 
the last line in this poem is where it's really elusive. You never really under, uh, you know, there's never really a clear underlying um, point of view. So the persona says, and that has made all the difference. It's almost as though the persona leaves us with the thought that one decision can change your life. And what makes this poem so appealing is that you can interpret it either way. You can interpret it positively in the sense that you know, the one less travel by, that decision that was made was the best decision and, you know, that has made all the difference, so my life is better because of it. Or alternatively, you can interpret it as perhaps that one choice in that person's life has made all the difference in the sense not for the positive but for the, the worse, the negative. Um, either way, I think what's interesting about this poem is that it leads you to sort of question your own decisions in life and, and make you more aware of the fact that choices aren't easily made. Um, so let's move on to structural elements. So once you've annotated the poem just like how I've just done and, and all of those ideas are just things that sort of pop into your mind as you're reading it. If you see a word and, and you, you think it could have a deeper meaning, then write down some ideas next to it um, and, and you know look for ways in which you can look beyond the literal meaning. Uh, other things that you might want to look for when you're analysing the poem are things like the organisation of the poem. So what I mean by that is you know, how is the poem organized into lines and, and stanzas? Now, stanzas is the word that we use to describe, you know, how many kind of um, sort of paragraphs or verses there are within, within the poem. Now, this particular poem that I found, it looks as though there are only two stanzas, but actually it's separated into four. Um, another way in which you would talk about organization is the form of the poem, like the type of poem it is. Now, this type of poem, it's called a narrative poem, which means that it's, it's a poem that tells a story. Uh, other forms of poems that we will look at in the next few lessons or next term are things like ballads, sonnets, lyrical poems, um, and they all have distinct features about them which make them that form of poem. So when you've read through a poem, it's always worth to have a look at, well, what form is it? Is it, a, is it a ballad? Is it a sonnet? Is it a narrative? In this case, it's a narrative poem because it's telling a story. Uh, another important thing to look at when you're analysing poems, um, which also goes into annotating, is the rhyme scheme. Now, rhyme schemes refer to the way in which the words at the end of each line um, rhyme. Sometimes you'll get poems that don't rhyme at all. Uh, it's a myth to say that all poems must rhyme because that's not true. Yet poems generally do rhyme, but not always the case. In this case, though, we do have a rhyme scheme and we decide the rhyme scheme by working out the way in which the words match up. So if you have a look at how I've labelled it here, I've written the letters A, B, a, A, B. What on earth do I mean by that? Well, if we actually have a look, the first line, the third line, and the fourth line all have words that rhyme. Would, stood, and could. So that means that I would label them with the letter A because that's the first letter in the alphabet and it's the letter that we use to signify the first rhyme in this poem. Now, the word both and growth, undergrowth, they rhyme as well. Now, the reason why I've written B after the first one is because the first and second line don't rhyme. So any time that you've got a word that deviates, you need to put the next letter in the alphabet. So in this case, the entire poem follows this rhyme scheme because if you were to go down and look at each stanza, it follows. So for example, the second one, fair, where, there. All three of those words, the first, third and fourth line, all rhyme. And then you've got claim and same. So once again, you've got the rhyming pattern A, B, A, A, B. Sometimes you'll get rhyming patterns such as A, B, C, B, or you'll get A, B, B, A, 
or you'll get A, B, C, D, okay, where, you know, they don't rhyme at all. It, it, they always just vary. So what you need to do is go through the poem and have a look to see if you can find a rhyming scheme just like how I did there. And then obviously this kind of happens automatically when you're analysing uh, poems, but you want to look for language patterns. So you want to look for things within the poem, such as metaphors, similes, alliteration, um, that convey a deeper meaning. So, for example, in this poem, one of the most important language patterns that we see is the extended metaphor of the road. Now, this poem, maybe it literally is about a person walking through the woods and coming to a crossroads, but I think it works more functionally when you're talking about it metaphorical, okay? So the road is a metaphor for life and the journey that we take and the decisions are the roads. So that's, you know, and a really important language pattern. It's called an extended metaphor and it runs throughout the entire poem. Um, other important language features that we see in here are things like nature imagery, okay? So throughout this entire poem, the reference towards nature is being made. It's a yellow wood, such as the ageing of someone's life. Um, undergrowth. Now, undergrowth is sort of a kind of uh, part of the forest where it's sort of all overgrown and, and it's not really easy to see through. So perhaps that's a metaphor for decisions in life that are clouded um, by anxiety or uncertainty. And then down the bottom, one, the road less travelled by. You know, if a road isn't travelled by very often, it means not very many people have walked down that path. So just like in life, sometimes there are decisions that not many people uh, make or, or, you know, places that people haven't really been within their life. So when you're analysing poetry, there's... You, you need to make sure that you're sort of looking at these structural elements because they can all kind of flow in together and help you make sense of, of what the poem is all about. So essentially having done all of the annotating um, and having sort of pulled the, the poem apart and looking at, you know, all of those different factors that we just went through just then, the very last step uh, in, in analysing a poem is to sit back and ask yourself, okay, well, what was the poet's message? What was their purpose for writing this text and what did they want readers to take away from, from this? Now, songs function exactly the same way. Artists will write songs in order for listeners to reflect on the ideas and emotions that they're trying to convey. So in Robert Frost's A Road Not Taken, um, there's sort of three main ideas that pop into my mind when I read it. Certainly the idea of choices. You know, the poet brings up the idea that choices in life can't be undone. Once you've made a choice, it can change your life forever. So it maybe is a warning, you know, don't make choices rashly. Think about the things that you want to do in your life and, and choose these decisions wisely. Um, the poet could also be talking about their own hopes and dreams. In a way, this poem sort of at the end of it, it almost seems as though those hopes and dreams were maybe lost because they tell the poem with a sigh. They tell this story with a sigh, like those hopes and dreams that were once there in front of them have been lost. And it also conveys the idea that when we're young, those hopes and dreams are at our fingertips and to maybe be careful not to... Um, you know, ruin those opportunities that we have. And then finally, another message is regret. Um, I get the feeling in this poem that the persona is regretful perhaps about the decisions that they made because they use the word sorry as if, you know, it's a decision that they wish that they could go back and redo. Um, but in a way as well, I also think to myself that there's a strong message at the end where it's not to be regretful about things in life. Um, you know, I took the road less travel by and that has made all the difference. That was my choice in life. That was the one that I chose to, to take and it's the way it is. Don't be regretful, you know, stick with what you've gone with and, and that's just life. Um, you know, they're my interpretations of the poem and I feel as though 
if you can justify your interpretation or the message or the idea that you took away, the theme essentially that you took away from the song or the poem that you're analysing, if you can justify it by providing examples um, and poetic devices and, and how you arrived at that idea, then that's fine. You can have any interpretation that you want, um, like I said, as long as it's justified. So that's basically the end of our presentation. Uh, hopefully this has been useful to you as long as you sort of follow these simple steps when you're analyzing poetry um, you should be fine so make sure that you remember the three main ideas what's the poet or artist feeling what has caused them to feel that way and finally how do you know what has been used in the poem in regards to words and phrases that have allowed you to arrive at that decision once you've done those three things, then you're all done. All right. So this is really a great, a great uh, interpretation and explanation of how you deal with uh, poetry. This is exactly what we just did. Um, what you are going to um, prove, like uh, when you are after the break, I'll give you a short quiz, a small quiz out of 10 marks, a poem where you have to analyze and apply the learning you get from the video and the learning, the instruction that we had this uh, past hour. So you can go for break now and come after 15 minutes, please. Come back at 6.15. Uh, be prepared for the quiz. <laughs> 